Ephesians 5, starting at verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're continuing uh, our sermon series in Ephesians this week. And um, in uh, verse 15, Paul encourages us uh, to be very careful how we live. And uh, I didn't know about you, but one of the things I have discovered through my experience is um, having ideas about how we would like our lives to be and actually living out what we aspire to um, are very different things. And uh, I keep coming back to something that um, the American preacher Tim Keller said. He said that Christian beliefs don't automatically produce godly character and behavior. You can believe in God and believe that God really loves you and yet be just as anxious, just as selfish, just as messed up as people who don't believe. How then are we to change? Well, often uh, when we want to change a behavior, and um, I don't know about you, but I, I think certainly I found the temptation is to try and tackle it head on. You know, we, we make resolutions. I'm going to stop doing this or I'm going to stop doing that, uh, whatever it may be. And sometimes, definitely in my experience, the resolutions we make um, are, are somewhat short-lived. You know, um, how many New Year's resolutions fail to make it to the end of the first week of January? I think probably an alarmingly high proportion. But even when we do better than that, if we're principally relying on our own strength and willpower, as we get tired or as other priorities come up, we easily slip back into old ways. And in this passage, Paul suggests that the obvious route to change uh, may not always be God's way. Sometimes the only way to reach your objective uh, is by taking a less direct route. Now, I love sailing. I would love to do more sailing uh, than uh, I have a chance to do. And one of the wonderful things about sailing is sailing upwind. You know, it's not possible to sail directly into the wind, but by setting a course slightly off the wind, it's possible to sail towards it. And by tacking and tacking and tacking and tacking, you can reach your destination, even though the wind is blowing the wrong way. Uh, but Paul, in this passage, unfortunately, uh, doesn't use the analogy of sailing. Um, uh, James does talk about sailing in, in, in his book, but in a slightly different context. Um, um, but Paul does talk here um, about walking. Verse 15 literally translates as, look carefully how you walk. And uh, again, if you're walking up a mountain, you will often not take the most direct route to the top. Um, as a family, we had a slightly disastrous holiday in the Lake District a few weeks ago. Um, there was illness and it rained, as only it can in the lakes. And there were a couple of times in our rather elderly waterproofs that you know, we got halfway around a walk and you know, at the furthest possible point from the car, it started tipping down with rain. And by the time we got back to the car, it was sort of like we are half-drowned rats. Um, but Joshie and I did manage to achieve our goal while we were in the Lake District of uh, climbing Scarfell Pike with Bethia. And uh, when climbing, if you are making it to the summit, you generally can't head straight up the mountain. You must traverse across sections of it and only slowly moving higher. And, this, and I think sometimes when we decide to do things in our own strength and our willpower, it's like just sort of powering straight up uh, and we simply can't do it. But this morning, as we look at Ephesians 5, I want to focus uh, on verse 18. And uh, this, this may not um, seem like a completely fun uh, holiday reflection, uh, uh, but there we go. So these are the verse, this is the verse I want to focus on. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, it seems that this verse is not aimed at any specific problem of drunkenness or debauchery in the church at Ephesus. 
um, but it's a more general instruction for the Christian life. And as such, it is equally written to us. And uh, I would like us to be open with the Lord this morning and to ask him if there are any patterns of behavior in our Christian walk which need to change. And I will suggest that if we're serious, there is a route that we can take, not the direct route of willpower, um, but winding up the mountain, tacking into the wind as we're filled with the Holy Spirit and as the Holy Spirit weaves transformation in us. And Paul starts, verse 18, do not get drunk on wine. Why does he choose, and out of all the things he could possibly have started with, why does he choose drunkenness? Well, I think it's no coincidence um, that um, on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles were first filled with the Holy Spirit, the people who watched them said, these people must be drunk. And I think that's one of the reasons Paul juxtaposes excessive drinking and being filled with the Spirit, because there is some similarity of effect. You know, to be drunk means to be soaked, to be saturated with alcohol. And as Christians, we are called to be soaked, to be saturated with the Holy Spirit. But the key contrast is this. People drink to excess for a variety of reasons. Uh, it can sometimes be to deaden internal pain, to help with problems they are facing, sometimes to get courage. And pharmacologically speaking, alcohol is a depressant. It depresses the highest centers of the brain, narrowing down our vision and lessening our self-control. And uh, the way alcohol helps us to deal with life um, is by making us see less of reality, by, uh, by diminishing the pain and lessening our perception of the problems that we face and the consequences that our actions will have. But the Spirit of God does the diametrically opposite. The Holy Spirit stimulates every faculty of the mind, the intellect, the heart and the will. Rather than being a depressant that limits what you see, the Holy Spirit simply shows you a bigger reality. That there is a sovereign Lord of history who loves you, who cares for every situation you find yourself in, and who is working all things together for good. And the truth is that the Lord has got you in the palm of his hand, and nothing can pluck you out of it. And as the Father mediates this truth into our hearts and fills us with his presence, and the Holy Spirit gives us, first of all, the courage to face our pain and to take steps on the path to healing. Secondly, it puts, the Holy Spirit puts the problems we face in the perspective of eternity. And finally, the Holy Spirit enables us to take risks in obedience. So effectively, what the Holy Spirit does is he aids us to take a godly control of our lives. Excessive alcohol dehumanizes. The fullness of the Spirit makes us more human, more like Jesus. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. What makes you drunk is not how much alcohol you have, but how much alcohol has you. And although Paul refers specifically to alcohol here, I think we can apply this passage to other addictive behaviours. The result of drunkenness, Paul says, is debauchery. You know, this may be excess eating, it may include sexual immorality. But at its root, the Greek word translated debauchery means literally to be not saved, um, but to be dissipated, squandered, or wasted. And for most Christians, the things we struggle with are not deliberate acts of rebellion against God. They often come from the brokenness in our lives and the strategies that we put in place to reduce our emotional pain and to help us get through life. And different people use different uh, and often multiple strategies. It may be busyness so that we don't have to think, overwork to feel valued, using food to feel comfort or exert control, binging on Netflix to distract ourselves, pleasing people to be wanted, using nicotine, alcohol or drugs to take the edge off, going from relationship to relationship to try and find love. And the trouble with these strategies is that they work. You know, they help us uh, to survive life. But they have consequences and they can lead to our lives being dissipated and wasted. We often um, become unable to stop doing these things. 
and they can draw us deeper and deeper into a self-destructive path, wreaking havoc in our body, in our mind, in our relationships, and with our bank balance. And most seriously, while we hold on to our own strategies for surviving life, the Holy Spirit does not have room to do what he wants to do to set us free. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now this is not a suggestion, uh, it's a command, uh, because the Spirit is the means through which God dwells in us and gives us the power for Christian living. And as such, it's not being filled with the Spirit is not just for special Christians, it's for every Christian. And Paul writes here in the present continuous tense, implying that we need to go on being filled. Be being filled with the Spirit may be a better translation. Because the fullness of the Spirit is not a once-for-all experience which we never lose. We need to be filled with the Spirit and go on being filled every day and every moment of every day. And the verb, be being filled with the Spirit, um, is it's passive. The onus is not on us uh, to work really hard, uh, but the onus is on the Holy Spirit who does the filling. You know, there's no technique that we need to learn. There's no formula we need to recite. But two things are essential. The first is a believing openness to the Spirit as we're sensitive to his presence and his leading. And secondly, a turning from what grieves the Spirit so that nothing hinders him from filling us. And uh, one of the things that this can mean is giving up, choosing to give up our strategies for surviving life, so that he can bring healing and release, uh, and release us into a new life of wholeness and freedom as we are filled and filled and filled. And uh, at the start of what I'm saying, um, I talked about the indirect way of the Spirit and I don't know about you, but I think, you know, most of us, we generally want to be healed and set free right now, ideally yesterday. Um, and how much more useful, we think, would we be to the Lord if that were the case? But often, God works on a completely different time scale uh, from ours. We look at our lives from the standpoint of this moment, and we're sort of looking in to an uncertain future. But the Lord sees our lives from the perspective of eternity. He sees the whole of your life, from your birth to your death. And he has a wonderful, perfect plan for those years, whether they be long or short. And the Father's objective is not to get each of us fixed in the short term, but it's to bring us into the incredible dance of love that is in the heart of the Trinity. That's always been his plan. And Jesus gave his perfect life on the cross and got the punishment that we deserved so that we can receive the resurrection life that Jesus' perfect life on earth deserved. We will have an eternity of perfection with the Father. But while we walk on earth, it is the journey, the walk that Paul talks about here that is key. And over the next two verses, Paul reveals three things that are vital for this journey as we tack into the wind of the Spirit and wind up the mountain of God. First, um, verse 19. And um, Paul says one of the overflows of being filled with the Spirit is speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Because actually being filled with the Spirit is not a private, mystical experience, but it's part of being a part of the body of Christ. We were never meant to get to heaven alone. We need to, and, um, yeah, we need to deal with our stuff proactively uh, for three things, for three reasons. One, so that we become more like Christ. Secondly, so that we become an easier habitation for the Spirit. And thirdly, so that we cause less hurt to those around us. And I would really like to encourage, uh, I do this um, you know, not infrequently, I'd encourage each of us to do the inner healing and deliverance work that we need to do. 
And so there are various um, sort of organisations that can help you on that journey. You know, get in touch with Streams of Hope at Winchester Vineyard. Uh, go to um, Glynley Manor, which is an uh, LL base uh, in East Sussex. Uh, go to Acorn Christian Healing Foundation, who have hubs in Guildford and Gosport. Or go to Harn Hill in Gloucestershire. It doesn't matter where you go. Um, but most of us will have stuff uh, that could do with some work uh, being done on that. And there are plenty of people who've been called by God to minister to Christians and help them go on that journey. But one of the dangers of working on our stuff is that we can develop an unhealthy focus on ourselves. You know, the psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit here are not primarily about praise of God, but a means of edification, instruction and exhortation for each other. You know, willpower is not enough if we're to give up our coping strategies. We need each other, both receiving from and giving to those who are on the same journey. And I would encourage you to be in a small group, to be in accountability relationships, to be in a mentoring relationship. Because the transforming power of the Spirit can only be fully experienced in community. And our journey, of our personal journey of healing is entwined with our part in the healing journey of our brothers and sisters in Christ. They help us and we help them. There's this amazing recipro reciprocality in the Spirit. <clears throat> and just another caveat here. The experience of the Spirit as a Christian community is not intended to lead us to retreat from people outside the church. We each have a calling to reach a world uh, that is bleeding and dying. And our focus on our own journey and our investment in church can easily draw us away from this. And as we walk with the Father, we must have each of these three things in balance, doing the work necessary for our personal transformation, giving to and receiving from our brothers and sisters in Christ as we go on this journey, and bringing the love of Christ to all those around us as we declare and demonstrate the good news of Jesus. And sometimes, rather than putting our energy into stopping a negative pattern of behavior, uh, the Lord will actually be calling us uh, into something new to change our focus. Rather than battling with yourself at home, we might be called to be getting out into the community to speak to people about Jesus, offering to pray for them. And as with the disciples in the New Testament, you may well find but healing and freedom as you go. And again, I think that's one of the sort of counterintuitive things uh, that the Lord calls us to do, not necessarily focusing directly um, on the specific things, but walking with him on this rather longer um, but deeper journey. Well, time is by, flying by, so I'll try and whiz through the last two things as fast as I can. Uh, verse 19b, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Well, here, uh, singing is not to one another, but to the Lord. And all our transformation starts with our Father in heaven. And our beliefs as Christians can only be changed, turned into changed character and changed behavior uh, through spiritual disciplines. And that's one of the reasons we spent time over the last year or so looking at prayer, looking at fasting, uh, looking at Sabbath, looking at solitude, because these disciplines actually give us the power to change our lives. And uh, the journey to transformation uh, is often not quick or terribly glamorous, um, but it's about regular, personal, intimate encounters with God as we worship from our hearts, singing, reading the Bible, praying, fasting, orienting our lives to Him and making space for Him. And these disciplines enable Him, the Father, to meet our deepest needs. Uh, so that we don't need our coping strategies. And if you tried a new discipline when we were preaching through it, um, but you've got out of the habit since, um, what about revisiting that um, maybe over the summer or starting in September? And finally, verse 20. Be always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, believers who are filled with the Spirit will be people who give thanks. And thanking God in the midst of all we face is a deliberate placing of trust in Him, His loving providence and redemption. And if we're to change, focusing on what God is doing 
as we give thanks is absolutely key. It's so easy to dwell on what is wrong, but the things we focus on are what we become. And we must learn not to focus uh, on our sin or our situation, but on the promises of God and how they are worked out in our lives. The battle for godly control in our lives is won or lost in our thoughts. And as Christians, we do not seek purity by living according to the law in our own strength. Instead, we thank the Lord for what he has done, that we are made a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And as we get these truths deep into our hearts, we begin to be able to live them out. So we need to give thanks. Well, the summer is often a season in which we have a bit more time as we go away on holidays. And uh, we often return in September re-energized and wanting to make the most of the rest of our time ahead. And I'd encourage you to use this time over the summer to continue to think about uh, and pray through what I've been saying today. Uh, You might want to ask the Lord if there are coping strategies in your life that he wants to set you free from things that help you survive life, but which actually lessen the freedom you have to be all that God created you to be. And if he shows you something, don't simply make a resolution of the will to change. Get in community with people who will help you and who you can help on their journey to become more like Christ. Put put spiritual disciplines in place that will be the scaffolding around which you can build your new life making space for God, worshipping, praying, reading scripture, fasting. And finally, give thanks to orient your heart to the truth of who our God is and all the good things he has done and his perfect plans and purposes for you. Don't let your life be spilled, be wasted, be dissipated, but be filled with the Spirit. Because the Spirit will take our lives and will weave a beautiful transformation in us.